All right, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. We are continuing our exploration of court procedure and evidence class here at Wake Tech. This is the spring 2023 semester. We are up to chapter 11 in uh, Joel Schrar's, uh evidence textbook, uh, criminal procedure textbook more properly. Joel Shamara. This is uh, published by Cengage Learning and we're in the 10th edition. Okay, so uh, this is the part two, sort of, even though it's a separate chapter of constitutional violations, other remedies against official misconduct. If you recall uh, last week or last time you uh, looked at this, we uh, looked at the exclusionary rule in chapter 10. This chapter 11, we're going to look at some other uh, aspects of that. Uh, again, we'll try to keep this lecture right at uh, 50 minutes to an hour. I don't like to um, you know, overtax you or bore you. Uh, so let's go ahead and move on to our first slide, and that's accountability for official illegal acts. Um, police officers are human beings like everybody else. They are going to make mistakes. They're going to make errors and some of those errors are going to be egregious enough that they constitute illegality. So there are a wide range of uh, things we can do to hold individual officers, um, hold police departments, and uh, the government in general accountable for these little acts. Now of course you could in theory extend this, although we're not going to spend a lot of time talking it, not just to the police themselves, but you could extend it to prosecuting attorneys um, who would represent the state at trial. You could extend it to judges who theoretically are the neutral arbiters at trial. You could extend it to uh, prison guards, um, corrections officers more properly called. You could extend it to the wardens. You could extend it to the prison system. So it, it doesn't just have to end at the police, even though we're going to talk about that um, almost exclusively because that's pretty much where most of the case law is. So uh, the first and foremost, it, it, let's suppose that a uh, take a fictitious interrogation goes bad. And in an official police interrogation, the interrogating officer kills the suspect. Um, obviously, um, you know, there's still a criminal char charge there. Now, if it's not, um, something as egregious as a death in custody. Um, it might merely be um, abuse, abuse of process. Uh, these can be handled through external or internal mechanisms. And you should remember that um, if I'm talking about things like, well, you can charge the police officers or you can um, attempt to reform the system, these are not mutually exclusive remedies. You can pursue both at the same time. So what are some of the remedies that are available? Let's jump in. Well, obviously, as I said, the first and foremost, we have the criminal law. I would say fairly that this is pretty rare. Um, it is certainly possible that a police officer acting outside of the uh, boundary of the Constitution can be charged with a crime. Um, we've seen this uh, uh, a few times in the United States history. Um, I would say that it's less likely at the local and state level different reasons, a little bit more common uh, at the federal level. It's more likely that there is civil lawsuit. That is, separate from prosecuting a police officer civilly, you can sue him as an individual. Or you can step up, sue the police department he works for, you can step up from there. You can sue the governmental entity that the police department is part of. So. If it was uh, a Raleigh police officer here in North Carolina, you could sue officer, we'll make up a name, Officer O'Malley. You could sue the Raleigh Police Department. You could sue the city of Raleigh. Arguably then you could try to sue the state of North Carolina. Good luck with that. Um, there's also not an action to recover, uh, not an action to punish like the criminal law is, not an action to recover damages like civil law is, but then there's also internal departmental review, which is disciplining the officer, correcting the problem in some way. Now, let's let's move on to that first option because that's usually the one people uh, think about it first, and that's um, 
well, why don't we arrest the police when they do bad? Um, so why aren't they? Well, one of the big issues here is it's very hard to prove intent beyond a reasonable doubt, um, especially if an officer honestly believes his actions were justified and lawful. So most of the time, uh, an argument, maybe not even a good argument, but an argument can be made that the officer believed what he was doing was permissible. Um, I think the second thing is a little bit subtler, um, and that's the lack of sympathy for the person whose rights are violated. So if I make up a fictitious situation, Officer O'Malley, um, outside the bounds of the Constitution, roughly interrogates a suspect, uh, beating him, slapping him, punching him. And that suspect confesses during that that he kidnapped little Cindy Who. And using that information, they locate Cindy Who and they rescue her. Okay, now you notice, in th this is sort of one of the more favorable ones toward the police. In this scenario, you're going to have to go to a jury and say, yes, Officer O'Malley uh, did these things to Black Bart, or Snidely Whiplash, whatever we want to call the criminal. Um, but, you know, here's little Cindy who's still alive. And that becomes hard for a jury, sometimes even hard for a judge, to have much sympathy for the person that's suing. Now, the more innocent the person who is injured is, so we're, instead of interrogating Snidely Whiplash, we're, interroga uh, we're inter interrogating, um, you know, Dudley Do-Right. Nice, honest, good guy. Uh, but, um, you know, we go beyond the bounds here. And uh, Officer O'Malley, in this case, uh, hurts Dudley Do-Right, breaks an arm, uh, fractures his eye socket, something like that. Now we can have a little bit more sympathy. But those cases are, I would say, fairly rare. Uh, at least today. And there you might have a little bit of sympathy. So, you know, this is true across the criminal law. It's one of the things I talk about when I talk about when I teach the criminal law is you have to have a sympathetic victim. A sympathetic victim gets you a long way to getting criminal charge. Do we have sympathy for the victim in the crime? If we don't, very often prosecutors are hesitant to proceed. So, uh, outside the scope of this, but think of this, if um, two extreme examples and you might say well neither one matters and the in the abstract I think you're right but using these two examples if you had a nun who was sexually assaulted and you had a prostitute who was sexually assaulted um, traditionally the law would obviously have more sympathy people inside the system would have more sympathy for the nun the, the assault still occurred it is entirely possible to steal and violate the personhood of a sex worker. But society being society, it has its sympathies um, towards one of those and not so much towards the other. Okay, well, let's move on. Let's not get too far down that rabbit hole. Prosecutors and juries are unwilling to evict officers for doing their jobs. I think prosecutor is the big uh, bulwark here. Is the prosecutor willing to poison his relationship with the police department by proceeding against a police officer? Prosecutors are very much dependent upon the police. They are, in many ways, almost extensions of the prosecutor's office and vice versa. Prosecutors work with the police all the time. Now, if they're actually going to go after someone that they have this working relationship with, some department or some individual, you can see how that is very difficult for them. So very often they will not. So one of the things you can see, for example, is they're often very hesitant to proceed criminal charges, so they will try to invoke grand juries. Now, I don't know if you remember, I talked about grand juries earlier, but grand juries essentially allows a prosecutor by himself to present only that evidence that he wants to present. No evidence, it's called inculpatory evidence. Only inculpatory evidence, evidence is likely to show guilt. In a grand jury proceeding, the prosecutor is under no obligation to present inculpatory evidence, evidence that will tend to show innocence. That means that most of the time in front of a grand jury, you can get an indictment. But if you don't want to, what you can do as a prosecutor is you can present a lot of evidence of innocence 
or let a lot of that evidence get in. The end result is if a prosecutor doesn't want to get an indictment, doesn't want the police officer to be even charged, he presents the grand jury evidence, but also presents a lot of evidence he's innocent. He's not presenting false evidence, and he gets an indictment or doesn't get an indictment, depending whether he does or doesn't. If he doesn't, if he doesn't present any exculpatory evidence, evidence tends to show an individual is innocent, he's liable to get an indictment. If he presents both inculpatory and exculpatory, all things being even, he is far less likely to get that indictment. Okay, civil actions. Let's go ahead and sue the police officer. Um, what are you doing when you're suing? Well, what you're doing is you're looking for compensation. If uh, let, Let's put this in simple monetary terms, although it can be difficult. Let's suppose during an interrogation, a police officer breaks the windshield of your car. He didn't have the right to do it, but he swung his billy club or um, through his actions, he broke the windshield of your car. And the amount of money it costs you to replace that is, and make up a number, $500 is $500. So in your civil action, you would sue for compensation. You would sue to be made whole. You would sue for $500. Now, civil actions can be brought in state court. Civil actions can be brought in federal court. And plaintiffs can sue just the officer. They can sue the officer and his immediate superior. They can sue the officer, his superior, and the whole department. Or he can go after the entity that controls that department, like the city or the county. Now, obviously, laws on damages vary depending upon who's named as your defendant and also what you're asking for. It's very easy to see the $500 for the windshield. What about pain and suffering? Let's suppose a police officer handcuffed you, put you in the back of the car, and when he did it, he twisted your arm. And he dislocated your shoulder. You had to go to the emergency room eventually. Uh, and your medical bill was $1,000. Okay, that's $1,000 is kind of concrete, but what about your pain and suffering for that? Or let's suppose that you were arrested in front of your small child. Your small child saw daddy without cause being unlawfully arrested by the police. What's, what's that worth? And you can see that the value there is much harder to establish. Okay, lawsuits against U.S. officers and the United States government. Um, if you're going to sue the U.S. government um, through law enforcement and the U.S. government, we're talking about a Bivens actions. These that's it's the constitutional tort, okay? A Bivens action, lawsuits against the federal government for uh, an officer of it have to sue under the Federal Torts Claim Act. Now you're probably thinking like, well, well why? Obviously, because here's the thing. Generally you can't sue the government. You can only sue the government when they pass a specific law that says, yes, you can sue us, and here's how you can sue us. You can sue anybody else, pretty much, under general theory of law. You can sue a plumber, a baker, a candlestick maker. You can sue anybody you want for a tort. But when you turn to sue the government, you can't sue under simple tort law. You've got to have a specific statute that allows that because of something called sovereign immunity. Basically, the government, unless it lets you, is immune from a civil lawsuit. So, lawsuits against U.S. officers. Uh, this came about in Bivens versus six unnamed FBI agents. And we didn't look at the case. It's, it's really just the the whole theory about what happened. Um, the case is pretty simple. Um, what happened is, it actually happens around Thanksgiving as I recall. The case is um, pretty old. It came down in 1971. So there were a number of, uh, half a dozen or so, FBI agents knock on Bivens door. They do not have an arrest warrant. They do not have a search warrant. Um, they come in, they arrest him for narcotics. They search his apartment everywhere. They arrest him. Um, he said they handcuffed him in front of his wife and his kids. They threatened to arrest his whole family. And they took him to, uh, this, this occurred in, uh, I believe, New York City. I think it was Brooklyn, actually. But they took him to the courthouse. 
and uh, he was interrogated, he was fingerprinted, he was photographed. Um, again, he was searched and booked. Um, and he claimed, look, this, this caused me a lot of humiliation. This caused me a lot of public embarrassment for something I didn't do. So in, in this case, the Supreme Court of the United States created the constitutional tort. They said, okay, prior to this, to this you did kind of have this right. So we're going to establish the Bivens tort. Court, tort. Uh, this is a private right to sue federal officers who violate your constitutional rights. Um, now you have to show that they were acting under legal authority or what appears to be legal authority and you have to show that they deprived you of a constitutional right. So it's not easy to get into federal law, uh, file a federal lawsuit under Bivens. Let's, let's look at a, a case that is in your text. And this next one is Anderson versus Creighton. Okay, so you can see how this is somewhat similar to the, uh, the Bivens case. So you, you've got this guy, um, uh, Anderson, who is an FBI agent. And on the, um, it's a November case, as I, as I recall too, this is, might be Thanksgiving, I'm not positive. But basically, um, they get a warrant to, con they, excuse me, they do not have a warrant. Um, they show up and they conduct a warrantless search of Creighton's family home. Um, they believe that, um, um, it was a strange name, I believe a man named Van, Van Deem or Van Dane, Dixon, a man suspected of bank robbery, might be found there, and he was not. So um, during this night, Robert Creighton and um, his wife and three daughters uh, were at home and they they see some lights at the front window they open the door and in comes several uniform officers plainclothes officers they've got shotguns they're loaded for bear um, all of them were and there, there, there's a racial issue here all of them were white and um, the uh, Creightons were black um, one of the officers supposedly, and this was verified by a police report, told him to keep his hands in sight while the others rushed through the door. Um, they said, do you have a warrant? And the officer says, we don't have a search warrant and we don't need one. You watch too much TV. So they, um, they, uh, the majority opinion still shielded these officers using an objective reasonableness standard. They said they got qualified immunity. The dissent said, well, no, there was no probable cause, no warrant, no proven action circumstances, and that means there's liability. So, I mean, do we have a clear abuse here? We do. Do we have a clear lawsuit here? Well, the analysis that was given was no. The analysis said, no, nope, um, we, we've set up something. And this, unsurprisingly, this is a conservative opinion. This is a Scalia opinion. Um, now, it's, it's somewhat strange because sometimes Scalia really focuses on the sanctity of the home but he didn't hear. Um, he really focused on, um, I guess, police rights would be the better opinion. Um, so in, in this case, um, the, the, it was a, a substantial social cost. They said, we need to analyze this using what is objectively reasonable. And so long as it's objectively reasonable, they are immune to a lawsuit. Um, so this brings up kind of this issue that I had mentioned a little bit before, qualified or sovereign immunity. According to the defense of qualified immunity, that is, were you acting in good faith, individual officers can't be held personally liable for official actions if it meets the test that it was objectively reasonable. And reasonable means what were the rules that were established at the time the action was conducted by the police. It, that, this makes it very, very difficult to win a Bevins case or Bevins case. Even though I tell you, yes, you've got this uh, federal constitutional right created in uh, the Bivens case to sue, um, you actually don't win very often. Matter of fact, it's very, very tough to win. So how do you sue the U.S. government? Well, plaintiffs um, can sue under the Federal Torts Claim Act uh, they do this because the Federal Torts Claim Act um, is an attractive mechanism. You don't have to look at it as much. 
and you can sue under both Federal Torts Claim and a Bevins Act. You, you can go via both. You, whenever you file a lawsuit, you need a legal theory under which you sue. Okay, now we're a little bit too far into inside baseball, so let's let's drop back down to the state. Um, so in in the state, okay, um, there's really two broad kinds of actions. Remember, I told you you can't sue a sovereign entity. You can't sue the federal government. You can't sue the state unless they let you. Now, remembering that every sub-entity, every city, every county is merely an extension of the state of North Carolina. So Raleigh is, in some ways, legally, a part of the state of North Carolina because it, North Carolina is the only sovereign entity here. That means that you can sue any part of the state of North Carolina, either the whole state, like if we use just the police as our example, the Highway Patrol, the SBI, or an individual department, okay, that is that is part of a entity like the Wake County Sheriff's Department or the RPD, the Raleigh Police Department. So in North Carolina, we have the North Carolina State, that should read, State Claims Act. And the state waives sovereign immunity if a state police officer, employee, or agent negligently, negligently causes harm acting in the scope of his duty. You also can use a federal civil rights lawsuit, which is a different way to do this. And we'll get to 42 U.S.C. in 1983 in a little bit. Okay, so let's uh, look at the next option criminal liability. Now in theory, if we're looking at the prosecutors, um, they are criminally liable for their non advocary what they do outside of court. Uh, but since we have the Civil Rights Act section 1942 and 1868, there is in theory criminal liability for public officials who violate constitutional rights. Since 1866, only one prosecutor has ever been convicted. What this effectively means is, yeah, you can sue the police. It's very, very difficult. In theory, you can sue a prosecutor for misbehaving, but it's basically impossible. One case in 160 years. Prosecutors have what is called functional immunity. Now, that means if they are really performing their job, at the time of whatever misconduct we're talking about, they're immune. That you're done. You might not like what the prosecutor done. You might say, "Well, they were out to get me," or "They didn't." You're done. If if we go back to the states, and we go back to the police, most illegal police acts, as I said, are state torts. Tort law gives an injured person the right to sue. Now, it's going to be limited because you're going to sue under that statute. The right to recover injuries caused by the official's torts has to be balanced against the need to do the law. And under these state tort acts, including North Carolina State Torts Act, um, officers are only liable if it's willful or deliberate. Now, I said there is a second mechanism, and I mentioned 42 U.S.C. 1983, which is the next thing to talk about. This is a federal piece of legislation that requires a little bit of history. Immediately following the um, Civil War, uh, the South had lost, the slaves had been freed, but many people in the South refused to accept this. And a terrorist organization, the Ku Klux Klan, was founded. And sometimes this terrorist organization had infiltrated, controlled, or ran basically law enforcement in a given state. And the federal government seeing this was saying, well, we have all these newly freed citizens, but they're being abused by state officials. So in order to combat the power of the Ku Klux Klan, they passed, the federal government passed, the Civil Rights Act of 1871. This became a law. It's called Title 42, Section 1983. It's a civil rights action. If you are acting under what we say color of law, you have liability for deliberate acts, um, and there's only lim there there can be limited liability. So this is essentially a way that if the state tort isn't good enough, 
you can use the federal law to sue civilly. Um, so suing state and local governments. You can sue the government in state court for state torts. You can sue governments under the U.S. Civil Rights Act. You're also free to sue individual officers. It's difficult. Um, the, there is a doctrine under the law called respondeat superior. It's Latin. Uh, it's, it's old language. And it, it says respondeat superior means let the employer, the master, respond, be liable for, the acts of the servant, respondeat superior. Let the master reply. Um, under the doctrine of respondeat superior, state and local governments and their agencies are liable if a employee commits a tort. Otherwise, you can simply say, well, you know, RPD didn't tell you to do this. Highway Patrol didn't tell you to do this. You just did it. Now, this only extends to torts that are committed by employees within the scope of their employment. So if a highway patrolman takes a squad car and rams you on the highway, without cause and flips your car and causes massive injury yeah you could sue but if he's driving his own car after he's off his job and he rams you and flips your car you can't sue the state of North Carolina now not all states have adopted this as a doctrine North Carolina has um, what do we do if you haven't well we have um, vicarious official immunity um, if, if you're now North Carolina has adopted this so this is the, not the case in North Carolina if the state does not recognize respondeat superior police departments local governments uh, sheriff's departments etc can claim official immunity of its employees and you know there is a balancing test here do we need effective law enforcement or do we need to protect the public and by and large more weights given to law enforcement all right, so let's go back to 42 U.S.C. 1983. Um, if we're going to sue here, it's very difficult. It's much more complicated to prove government liability under U.S. civil rights action. You have to show that they were acting within the scope of their authority and there is written or policy basis to back them up. You also have to show that you clearly, clearly violated a plaintiff's constitutional rights. Again, very difficult to establish. There is no duty to protect. Now this comes as a surprise to most people. You say, well, what's the job of the police? Well, they're supposed to protect us. Okay, well, what if they don't protect us? Well, can I sue them? And the answer there is pretty much no. <laughs> there is no affirmative duty to protect when an individual um, police officer doesn't do his job. There's no affirmative duty to protect rule. Law enforcement has no constitutional duty to protect individuals from each other. So um, the police don't show up when a robber breaks in your house, someone gets shot, someone gets killed, you sue the police department, it's going to get tossed. Um, now, if there's a special relationship, um, then maybe. And some stores have created, uh, well, if the state created the danger, then maybe, and I could go through a couple scenarios here. Uh, for the second one, for example, let's suppose the, the state, um, there was a bridge that was built and maintained by the state and it washed out. And a police officer shows up and he could put out flares to tell uh, people don't drive over the bridge, but he doesn't. And somebody drives over the bridge and their car crashes into the water because the bridge is unsafe. Then you could argue there might be a special relationship um, or if the bridge was poorly designed, you could argue that it's a state-created danger, but you can see how tough those would be. All right, so um, we're going to move on to uh, one of these, the first ones. We're going to look at the Browers case. Um, so Thomas Vanda was a schizophrenic, and he had been institutionalized um, in 1976 and he had actually killed a woman in 1971 but he was released and in 1977 he when he's out um, he kills another woman he kills uh, Marguerite Bowers and her husband 
sues under 42 U.S.C. 1983. So it's a, it's a state federal action. And he says, um, you let him out. You're negligent. And the court said, no. Um, yes, it's a terrible thing. We're very sorry for you. But no, we didn't create the danger. He was already dangerous. We might have exacerbated it. You might be right. Maybe we should have kept him in prison. But the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties. We guarantee you that we're going to leave you alone. We don't guarantee you that we're going to help you. All right, so the next one, now we're starting to look at a few more cases here, is um, the city of El Paso, uh, Beltran. And in this case, uh, Herrera called a 911 operator about the, a father who had a history of violent abuse. And dispatch put him on a very light, low priority. And a little bit later, this father kills Herrera and the mother. And the grandmother files a lawsuit under 42 U.S.C. 1983. And they said, you know, it was your duty to protect us. We called. You didn't come. You didn't deal with this. We told you there was a danger. And they lose. Uh, no violation of substantive due process here. Okay, so what about then, is there any sort of incident where the police failing to act, where they don't protect someone, there, there can be liability. Well, like I said, you have to show a special relationship. The strongest special relationship is a matter of custody, and this is where we're kind of getting back to, um, I would say, back closer to reality um, and, and closer to our case. A custodial situation. If a police officer has put someone in the back of their squad car, if a police officer has arrested someone and has them booked downtown, you're responsible for that person. So I remember reading a case, um, and it's not covered in your text, but basically they arrested someone who was suicidal, and uh, they didn't search her, and she killed herself. And she was in, in their physical custody, and procedure is you search people in physical custody, and she said she was uh, suicidal. She had lost both her children, as I recall. I think it was an Alaska case. And the court said, look, you knew she was suicidal, you didn't follow basic procedure. There is a special relationship between you and her. Therefore, there's liability. The, the next one is state-created danger. Um, if there's this special relationship and a private individual threatens death or injury. So let's suppose, again, it's a custodial situation. And you put them in a jail cell with Mongo. And Mongo says, I'm going to rape and kill this guy. And he does. He rapes and kills this guy. And you know as the police that Mongo's a dangerous guy. You can see how you'd have action. Now sometimes the police create or enhance the danger beyond mere presence. And sometimes the police go so far that the courts say this was deliberate indifference. They, and this is particularly true of custodial situations. And it is a shock to the conscience of anybody reading this case and there should be liability issues. All right, let's look at um, a case, a protest case, uh, Dwyer's um, versus the city of New York. So during this case, um, there was a group of people that were um, burning a flag. Uh, they were on the left politically. The police um, didn't like this. The police uh, were a very conservative institution. They saw this as an assault on patriotism. They saw some skinheads, which were a right-wing neo-Nazi group in New York City um, in the 90s and late 80s. And basically, the skinheads started to beat the people that were burning the flag. And the police said, look, as long as this doesn't get out of control, we're not going to stop you. And this was essentially seen as a license to do this. So Dwyer is sued even though there's no actual custody. It's not the point where, okay, I'm under your control and you're letting this happen. But you can see how this, this goes pretty far. Um, now, the district court had initially dismissed this, and they dismissed it based on uh, something called the DeShaney versus uh, Winnebago um, County Department of Social Service case, uh, where they said, look, the police have no affirmative duty to come to this guy's aid. Um, but in, in this case, they said, even though there's no custody, you, you went pretty far, so we're going to let the suit proceed. 
Um, so I mentioned that case of Winnebago uh, DSS. What happened here is um, there was a child who had a very violent father who had beaten the child. Uh, there was a strong suspicion of child abuse. He eventually um, was, the, the child was returned to this violent father and the father eventually beat the child so badly as to cause brain trauma profoundly mental disabled um, and under this case um, the court said that that's still not enough it is a positive doctrine of liberties not a negative one now the dissent argued that excuse me that's, that's the dissent's argument I just I just flipped that for you the dissent said you have some duty to intervene the majority said no we don't I mean, this is hard for many students to wrap their minds around. We kind of think, well, someone screwed up here. There's no question someone screwed up. But the, the rule is going to be, even if the government screws up, they often do not have liability because they don't have that responsibility. The private parties, the fathers here, actions trump and are more important than what the government didn't do. All right, now the next one. Uh, another case here. This is the town of Castle Rock versus Gonzalez. Uh, this is a, a pretty recent case. In this case, uh, Jessica Gonzalez had a restraining officer uh, against her husband. Um, so she, um, try, the, the husband comes, violates the restraining order, uh, and gets the three kids. And she tries uh, and tries and tries to get the police involved. Uh, trying to get the police to enforce this court order. Um, and the husband, after taking these three children, kills all three of them. Then he actually goes on a rampage and attacks the police station. And she sues. She says, look, you know, I had a court order. I asked for you to enforce it. You didn't enforce it. Here's a special relationship, possibly. And the court said, it's not mandatory enforcement. It's a process, it's not a right, dismissing the case. And, you know, again, this is, uh, this is a Scalia case. So usually when the, if, if the police are going to win, Scalia is going to write the opinion. Uh, the dissent case here um, was written by Stevens and was joined by uh, Ginsburg. But she said, look, it, it, clearly so under the Colorado statute, there be, should be some liability. All right, let's look at a slightly earlier case. Uh, Pindar uh, versus Johnson. Pindar and three children confronted Pritman, who was an ex-boyfriend, who a year earlier had set fire to the house. The police took him into custody, but they only charged him with a misdemeanor. He was released. He goes back to her house. He sets fire to the house. He kills the three kids. The 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 mother um, sues the police department and says, "Look, you didn't protect me. I called you. You picked this guy up." You let him out for a misdemeanor? He was trying to kill me. And indeed, he did kill three of my children later. The appeals court said the police have qualified immunity and dismissed the case. They said the police didn't set fire to the house. Um, Pittman did. And we can't be responsible for his actions, even if, if we had charged him with a felony, he would have been in our custody. Now, to the dissent, again, this... Um, uh, this is um, this is a court of appeals case, uh, Fourth Circuit. So it's not like I can say this was written by Scalia, but the, there was a dissent here that said the officer helped create the danger by his action, by his failure to do it. But we're not buying it. Okay, so that's a lot of the police. Let's let's step aside, talk a little bit about the judges and the prosecutors. We had touched on those earlier, and I mentioned how hard it is. But let's take a quick look. Can you sue a judge? No. Judges have absolute immunity from civil suits, meaning you cannot sue them. You can't go after them. And there's been cases of judges doing terrible things. But a like I, I, I talk in um, our constitutional law class, a judge is the closest thing to God when he's sitting in his courtroom. What a judge does in his courtroom, pretty much he can do whatever he wants. Judges enjoy absolute immunity from civil suits. Now, he can be charged criminally, but that's freakishly rare. 
you can't sue them even if they act maliciously and in bad faith civilly. The only remedy is if they're elected, vote them out of office, or you can try to impeach them, which is a removal usually by legislative action, uh, and it's almost impossible. It's exceedingly rare to remove a sitting judge. So if you ask, well, what liability civilly do judges have, I would have to say almost none. Um, it's hard to come up with a single case of a judge getting in trouble civilly in the 250 odd years of the American Republic. What about prosecutors? Prosecutors have functional immunity. Um, they have absolute immunity when they're acting as advocates for the state. If they're doing administrative duty or investigatory duty, they have limited liability. So still, very hard to get to them. A little bit easier than the judge, but very, very hard. So judges ain't gonna happen. Absolute immunity. Prosecutors, functional immunity, they're probably gonna skate. And the functional immunity doctrine, you, you can look at it, your, your, your book had several cases it outlined. Um, I don't know that uh, we need to go through each and every one of these. Um, it, it had the uh, Patchman case from 76, the Reed case from 91, I believe, uh, the Fitzsimmons case from 93, and then it did the Fletcher case from 97. Okay, so people who sue the government, I just want to tie this all together before we move to, we're moving out of lawsuits, we're going to go to administrative remedies. Um, I have to remember, it's very expensive. Because you're going to have to find a lawyer who's going to take your case. This is not something you can do yourself. Two, it takes a long time. If you look at the spread between the number of years in these cases, you'll notice that an incident can occur in 2000, and you don't get to court till 2003 or 4, and you don't get to your appeals court till 2003 or 5. It can take five or more years. Third thing, juries are much more likely to believe police officers than you. Um, because very often the people that are suing have problems already. Sometimes they're criminals themselves. Some officials have absolute immunity, judges, or some sort of type of qualified immunity or functional immunity if we're talking about prosecutors or some official immunities. Also, officers have no affirmative duty to protect you. They don't have to do their job, in other words. And the final thing to remember is a lot of cases are going to be frivolous. A lot of cases are people that really don't have a case and feel they do, but they don't. Um, I was watching a video today where there was a, um, a woman whose last name was Cumberbatch, and she was, I believe, Jamaican. Uh, in any event, she was an African-American. She can trace her lineage back to the 1800s, and the Cumberbatches, which... Uh, was a white British family that lived in Jamaica, owned slaves. And there is an actor today called Bernard Cumberbatch. And she was saying, well, you know, it's proved that his ancestors owned my ancestors, so he owes me money. Um, now, there may be some sort of social death. There may be an argument for reparations. But there is no way that she could go into a court of law, as the law stands today, file a lawsuit against Benedict Cumberbatch and win. That would be a frivolous lawsuit. You may indeed have a moral argument. Look, his family benefited from how my, my family suffered. There's an institutional debt. There is a societal debt. Great. I understand that. Not a lawsuit. A lot of lawsuits are frivolous. Um, and will get tossed. All right. So let's look at administrative agencies. Um, there's really a couple ways in which we answer that uh, ancient quote from the Romans, uh, quas custodius custodias, who shall guard the guards? How do you keep an eye on people? Well, one of the ways we've decided to do it is not through lawsuits, but internally with the police. So in almost all police departments, there are two types of potential administrative reviews. Most of the time, 99% of the time, it's just the first one, internal affairs units, IAU. This is part of the police department, run by the police, staffed by the police, police investigations, police reviews, looking to see if they themselves screwed up. The police guard themselves. Sometimes 
usually because there's been a problem or a scandal, they ask for external civilian review. But most of the time, it's internal affairs units. So most large departments like Raleigh, Durham, uh, Fayetteville, Wilmington, or New York City, Chicago, Los Angeles, have special internal affairs units. They will review police misconduct, and they there's four stages here. Intake, okay, we have a complaint, in other words. Investigation, let's find out the facts. Deliber deliberation, was there any violation? Disposition, does anybody need to be punished? It is not a civil lawsuit. You're not fining people. You don't go to file an, a complaint with internal affairs to try to get money. It's not criminal. The officers are not going to get arrested. Um, the worst that could happen is they get fired. Um, if we look at these results, there are really four possible results. Um, unfounded action didn't take place. You, you claim that this guy beat you, there's no evidence of it. Or two, exonerated. Okay, yes, he hit you, but you were trying to stab him at the time. So the act he took was justified, lawful, and proper. Three is more in the middle. Three says, we don't know. There's not enough evidence to find for you. There's not enough evidence to find for the police officer. It is not sustained. He's not going to get punished. The fourth one is, it is sustained. You claimed he beat you. He claimed you beat you without cause. Yeah, he should have done that. We're going to punish him. And that punishment is up to the police and the procedure in the police. It might be, at one extreme, you fired. We're done with you. It might be, we're going to dock you pay. We're going to demote you. We're going to reassign you. Uh, sustained is only where they take actions. So if the allegations are sustained, you can have a reprimand. You can have a transfer. You can have retraining. You can have counseling. You can have suspension or dismissal, or they can fine you. And usually that's part of your salary. Now the criticism here is obvious. Do you trust the police to police themselves? You know, and this is very delicate because some groups have very good records of policing themselves. Some groups have very bad records of policing themselves. Some parts of the public say you can't accept the legitimacy of self-supervision. It's just inherently corrupt to do. Nonetheless, this is where we are. Most of the time, for most police misconduct, it's internal review that happens. Now there can be a little external review. Um, this was established really to deal with some of these and what happens, and this doesn't exist in all departments, is civilians participate. So as opposed to just the police doing, all right, is it a founded application, how the investigation go, what are the results, here's the penalties or not. In that four-step process, we're going to have a civilian there. And they can help collect facts, they can review reports, they can make recommendations, and they can review what happens. Uh, now, I'll be honest about this. Most police departments hate external review. They feel like these citizens are playing Monday morning quarterback, they're judging them for things that they have no expertise in. Um, they don't understand the complexities of law enforcement. And there is, you know, a positive and a negative here. Um, you know, does a civilian really understand what a police officer is up to? Conversely, you know, can't you make the police more liable for what they do? So the police, um, in general, dislike external reviews. It interferes, they feel, with it. Uh, outsiders don't understand it and there is this definite blue curtain that hides real police work from public view. Now, um, what's the effectiveness of these external reviews if you don't like them? Um, well, sustained rates uh, from external review are very similar to internal review. Um, what is effective? It might mean, do you control police misconduct? Do you resolve complaints to satisfactory levels? Do you preserve police confidence? Um, do you provide good feedback to the community? You know, this is um, something that certainly we are seeing, um, oh, uh, 
difficulty in really grappling with this problem. And I, I don't think we're done here. I think this is one of those things that is an ongoing part of society that tends to flare up at different things. And, I, and if I had to say it's driven by one thing, it's driven by, and this is going to, this is a personal opinion, it's driven by the technology that we all carry in our pockets. In the past, if I said this police officer acted outrageously, it was my word against his word. He was a cop. We've all been raised to respect authority. Less likely that that's going to succeed. Today, all of a sudden, people have cameras, video cameras, in their pockets, and we are seeing a lot of instances of, oh, hey, you said this police officer abused you, and looking at the tape, sure seems that way. So until this kind of settles out, and obviously now we know one of the things we're seeing is the police are themselves carrying cameras, in part to combat this, like you didn't show the whole tape or you didn't understand. So I think technology is something that is both creating this problem and offering solutions to it. But we'll see how that shakes out in the future. Okay, right around 50 minutes is what I wanted. Um, Whenever you're ready, you can move on to Chapter 12, and we're going to move into uh, court proceedings. Chapter 12 is all about what happens before trial, which is, to be honest about you, to give you a sneak preview, where a lot of the work gets done. All right, you all have a present uh, morning, afternoon, or evening, and I will see you for Chapter 12 whenever you're ready.